This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. All right, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and start. This is the uh, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to basically welcome or you know, kick off, I guess, the first of this year's um, A. Richard Newton Distinguished Innovator Lecture Series, of course, um, co-held uh, with Life as an Entrepreneur. Um, and uh, um, I'm about to introduce Leslie Batorf, who is a uh, partner in the medical technology area at Onset Ventures. And, um, you know, She's really like an ideal person for today's lecture. One reason why I say that is that quite often um, in this series, we're a little guilty of having a lot of IT slash software slash Google, Facebook, so forth um, types of stories and types of lectures. And I'm really happy that this time we're making good on our promise of, of being balanced and um, kicking off with a different area with, with a very important area, obviously the context of medical and uh, healthcare opportunities. So, um, and then in terms of background, again, Leslie is like, you know, just perfect match to give this uh, presentation. I'll just say a couple of words about her background and I'm gonna hand it over to her. Um, she's got 20 years approximately um, working experience in, um, in, in the medical related industry plus um, uh, investment experience. You know, she's been uh, an investor or board of advisor in eight different firms. And um, she has operating roles, you know, part of those 20 years operating roles at Medtronix, at Nellicor, Ventri, well, I may get the names of these just slightly off. Ventri, is it Ventric? Ventritex. Ventritex. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Men Menlo Care. Um, and uh, GE Medical Systems. So combination investor operating roles and just guru, I guess. So there you go. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Well, I am thrilled to be here and talking to all of you about a couple of my favorite subjects, and that is healthcare and entrepreneurship. So um, what I thought I would do uh, cover today is, first of all, since uh, I understand that I'm probably the, the first person and the only person to talk about healthcare, is to give you an overview of, of uh, what that business about, is about and some of the entrepreneurial opportunities available there. And then we can talk about uh, a little bit about I'm a venture capitalist and, and what I would look for in a startup company if I were evaluating a startup company. Um, and then also um, talk a little bit about the characteristics of successful companies and maybe how you can characterize different types of companies uh, in thinking about an entrepreneurial idea in the healthcare business. And then the last thing we'll cover is I, I have some thoughts and uh, considerations that hopefully would be helpful to you in terms of thinking about a career path, whether it be in healthcare or entrepreneurship or both. So uh, that's what I'd like to cover. So let's start with um, healthcare. Um, healthcare. The healthcare industry is very big and it is growing dramatically. Uh, and as you can see here, it's 17.4% already of the whole gross domestic product in the United States. This is United States numbers only. Um, and it's uh, scheduled to grow to more than 20% of the GDP by the end of the decade. So it's very large. What does that mean in terms of uh, absolute dollars? Well, it's 2.7 trillion as of uh, last year. And it's going to grow to 4.6 trillion by the end of the decade. Um, so very tremendous opportunities as well as growth. So 
Why is that? What's going on here? Well, there's a couple. Of, there's a lot of reasons involved in it, but a couple of them um, are, are particularly important. And one is that the baby boomer generation, and, and that's actually my generation, the uh, group of people that were born after World War II to uh, sometime in the 60s, uh, is now reaching the age where we're old age and we're getting to Medicare uh, uh, type ages and uh, have health problems. And just a, a picture is worth a thousand words. Just to have some idea here, this uh, young man up here uh, is a young rocker from the 60s uh, with the Rolling Stones. You might recognize Keith Richards. That was in his better days in the 60s. And a picture's worth a thousand words. There's Keith Richards recently. <laughs> so what does that show it? Saying that you know this baby winner generation may be in need of some health care soon. Well, and there's another. <laughs> To get to yeah, he looks better than he would have had he not had that help. Exactly. So, um, and then there's another thing going on here, and it's what I call diabetes. A lot of people call diabetes, and that is the epidemic of obesity that you probably heard a lot about in the in the uh, media. And and right in conjunction with that, and related to that, is the epidemic of di uh, diabetes. And uh, so, uh, the picture worth a thousand words here is uh, our friend, the old Italian, uh, the David, in the Uffizi Museum. And uh, here is what happened to David when diabetes happened to him. <laughs> so, so that gives you some idea. There's two really big things, and among many other topics that are going on that are really causing this part of the industry to grow rapidly. So, how does it compare to other things? Well. Uh, Health, global health care, the numbers I gave you before with the United States. So global health care uh, in 2010 was six trillion. And to give you some idea, the entire GDP of the country of China in that same year was less than that. All right. And if, if global health care were actually a country on its own, its GDP would be second only to the United States of America. So it's very large. And contrast that with the information technology. I know you hear a lot about that here at Berkeley. But you know, that's a mere pittance of Germany. <laughs> compared to China, OK? So that gives you some idea. A very large uh, market, a very large part of the whole economy, the worldwide economy. So what's going on in healthcare in the future? Well, it costs a lot. The, the costs are going up much more rapidly than the gross domestic product right now. And um, so uh, suffice it to say that, uh, that that's going to be one of the topics of politicians. And really, a lot of you, as you grow in your careers uh, of what's going on in business, is how are we going to do something about this, uh, this difficulty? So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the entrepreneurial opportunities uh, in healthcare. So just to look at where the venture capital money is going, about 27% of venture capital investments in the last year and a quarter have gone to some form of health care. Uh, and the rest, the 73% is information technology, clean tech, uh, consumer, uh, social media, what, whatever else. Okay, And of that, about 16% of it is what would be called biotech or pharma. It's really drug development or tools for drug development. And then another 10% of that would be medical devices. And that would mostly be electromechanical type devices, whether they be implantable or disposable or whatever uh, capital equipment um, uh, in that category. And, and that's really my specialty as an investor. That's really what I spent uh, 19 years in the industry doing. And then I've been 15 years now in the, in the uh, venture business supporting those kinds of companies. Um, and then 1% of it is healthcare <laughs> services. So what are the characteristics of the healthcare industry as compared to some other industries like information technology or energy or some other areas? Well, number one, it's highly regulated. And the reason for that is that governments want to have a say in what's being done to their citizens and want to make sure that it's safe for their citizens. Um, and so there is good news and bad news with that. The good news is that there is this tremendous opportunity for uh, barriers to entry as a startup company or even as a large company. Um, the, the bad news is the time to market. You know, these things are going to take time because they need to be tested uh, on a number of people and a number, in a number of ways over a period of time, and they need to get through that process. So um, that's the downside, as well as they're going to take, because it takes a long time, they're going to take uh, more capital than maybe some other areas. So, um, and in this business, there are consequences. There are consequences of brilliance, a brilliant insight that you might have, and that is that that leads to a lot of lives being saved. Wow. I mean, how many people can say that about their career? And then there's a the downside to that. Mistakes lead to a lot of dead people. 
All right. So uh, it's it's very crucial in terms of uh, you know how careful you are and and what you're doing with your business. Um, and uh, patents and, and invention are extremely important in this area. Uh, the know-how uh, of, of uh, the applications here creates strong barriers to entry. And particularly, uh, if you know a lot about, a deep, uh, have a deep understanding of the applications um, uh, in, in medical and in the engineering techniques, it's a huge advantage for you as an entrepreneur. And creativity and novel insights are highly rewarded. You can do very well if you're talented at that. And then the other characteristic of this business that may be different from um, others is that there is a very cooperative relationship between the really big companies like Medtronic and General Electric and uh, Johnson & Johnson, Abbott Labs, those kind of companies, and the startup companies. It's very symbiotic and very friendly. And um, the reason for that is that these large companies uh, have a tr throw off a tremendous amount of free cash flow. They have a lot of cash because it's a very big business that they're supporting and they have good margins. But um, the downside for them as of recently is they used to be growing in the mid-teens to 20s uh, not too long ago, like let's say last decade. Um, and this decade, they, their growth has substantially slowed down. And uh, they're kind of single, you know, single digit growth uh, these days. So they have cash, they need growth. Well, what do startups have? They have growth, they need cash. So it's a marriage made in heaven. And, it is, and, and what you'll see is a lot of corporate venture uh, uh, activity, tremendous amount of cooperation of the, of the venture uh, firms from the corporations, along with us venture capitalists uh, that are financial investors. So um, this gives you a breakdown a little bit about how you can think about the different buckets or the different, different subsectors of medical for entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, as I said, there is the devices and the drugs and drug development and then healthcare services. There's also some other categories that are noteworthy. Uh, one of them is uh, drug delivery, and that could either be a, a, a device or it could be a drug. Um, and then there's healthcare IT, healthcare information technology. Uh, you know, the healthcare industry has really lagged behind you know, many other industries in terms of uh, information technology. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, it's not because they're dumb. Uh, it's because um, it's a very fragmented uh, business. And accuracy and privacy are really important uh, uh, to, to uh, anything to do with, uh, with healthcare. Um, but, it's really burgeoning right now because this, this industry needs uh, things that make it more efficient because we're just spending too much money and it's too much overhead. So, and then there's diagnostics, and that's generally referring to um, th instruments and things in the clinical diagnostic lab, or it could be a, a, a actually a DNA test or something like that, but that's diagnostic. So all of these are areas that are ripe for innovation and that have been supported in the past and continue to be supported uh, for entrepreneurial activities. So let's talk about what's going on in the healthcare industry as a whole. You know, right now today, it, it's it, you could say it is in chaos. <laughs> it is. It is. There are massive disruptions going on uh, in the healthcare business, and uh, the reason for it is it's unsustainable cost. Uh, the, the GDP is not growing nearly as fast as the cost of healthcare, and so that's just in the end very unsustainable, and it's come to a, a real loggerheads. Um, and the patient demographics are part of the reason that's happening. We've talked about that. Uh, the population is getting older, it's getting sicker, and the expectations are much higher for the quality of care. The other thing that's going on is globalization. Some countries that heretofore had probably pretty poor uh, health care uh, for their citizens compared to um, uh, the United States are now picking up and they're spending money for their population to have better uh, health care, like, for instance, in China and India. There's a tremendous amount of activity going on there, Brazil, some of these other countries. And then um, the Accountable Care Act, um, that's actually the recent very large piece of legislation that has been dubbed in the media as Obamacare. Okay, that's, that's being implemented and will continue to be implemented over the next few years. Um, and, and what that is doing is it's changing, uh, it's changes and making changes in the structure and the incentives of who's providing health care and who pays what to who. Uh, it's changing, it's, it's, it's transferring risks from some, you know, some groups like, for instance, insurance companies onto hospitals or onto physicians. So there is a lot of disruption going on with the structures within health care. 
Um, and then the other thing that's very exciting, particularly for the talents in this group, is technology advances. Tremendous amount of work going on in terms of understanding disease processes, and therefore, how can we provide a therapy or a diagnostic for them? So what, is all, what do all these trends mean? Well, it means that you're going to need lower cost. And it also means you're going to need more volume at lower cost. And it, it means that there are opportunities for new business models to be formed as this structure reshuffles itself. And these technology advances are really the fuel that's going to allow all of those things right there. You, you can't get there from here if you had to depend on a doctor who's now seeing maybe 40 patients a day, that that doctor is suddenly now going to see 80 patients a day. Ain't going to happen. You cannot scale that. But if you can do some things with technology, then you have something in terms of being able to reduce the cost. So uh, in a nutshell, we got these pressures to reduce cost. And then we got these pressures because there's growing needs. The market's growing like crazy. And so in the middle there, there is a gold mine to be had. And that is where uh, Onset Ventures and other venture capitalists and you as entrepreneurs need to be looking for investment opportunities. Um, and I can't emphasize this point enough. The really good thing, you know, you've, you've seen those beer commercials, great taste, less filling. Well, this is, you know, costs less and improves quality care. That is the winning ticket right there. Uh, you know, if you can have one or the other, that's good. If you can have both, you're golden. If it doesn't reduce costs, it's probably a problem because this system is not going to take things that um, cost more money. And so I wanted to give you some examples of what, you know, what are we talking about in terms of reducing costs? How do you do that with technology? Well, uh, things like um, days in the hospital, that's really expensive to the system. And there are some venues that are more expensive than others. Like, for instance, hospitals are way more expensive than outpatient centers or clinics or doctor's office, right? So if you can figure out an invention or a procedure that you can do with a patient that um, reduces the amount of time in the hospital or that takes it from a hospital surgery to a outpatient procedure, you can save the system a ton of money. And so that's right for innovation. The same thing can be said with chronic diseases. Uh, we talked about obesity and diabetes. Other things would be like congestive heart failure. Um, and, and so. You can save a lot of money if you can manage patients to be stable that are living with those diseases and they don't go into the emergency room or have to go in and out of the hospital several times. That's massively expensive. Um, and uh, you know, an example of that is uh, uh, Valeritas is one of our, um, our companies that has a disposable, very inexpensive mechanical pump for diabetics, type 2 diabetics. Um, Failed therapy, therapy you spend a lot of money on to try to fix something like, for instance, um, let's say back fame, pain from a degenerated disc. You spend a lot of money, do this fusion surgery, patient still has uh, back pain. Wow, that was a complete waste. And so if you can make that more successful or do something that's cheaper and more successful, then you got something. That's the example of this company, Relievant, from our portfolio that does that. Um, Complications are really expensive to the healthcare system. Uh, complications uh, are, are inevitable in some ways, but you can do certain things that improve safety and reduce complications. Um, and then also, high things that are high volume. Is there a way that we can make it more cost efficient or take less time? So these are the nature of the kinds of opportunities that technology could bring um, that could help the system save money and that you as the entrepreneur and your company can also still do very well and make a lot of money. Um, so I actually want to give you an illustration of one of those. Uh, th this is actually a, uh, a picture of, a, of a, a, the Sadra Lotus valve. This is a, an aortic valve that is uh, percus percutaneously inserted. And what that means is this, is this valve uh, actually uh, goes into a small catheter, and it's put in via a catheter through a hole in the groin, and then it's snaked up through the artery and put in place uh, into the, the heart, as opposed to somebody doing a big surgery, cutting open this chest and cracking the chest open and cutting out the old vol valve and um, sewing it in. So, um, and this is actually a picture of, um, this was an early uh, rendition of the Sadra valve, and this is a prototype of it. But, so I want to tell you the story about cost uh, savings of this, of this particular product. 
So if you did an open chest surgery to get a new aortic valve, uh, you're gonna do it in an operating room and it's gonna take an average of 11 days in the hospital. It's gonna cost uh, quite a bit of money versus if you did this percutaneous aortic valve, it's done in a cath lab, much less expensive venue where they only put catheters in, in a hole in the groin. So the total cost of the surgery is something like $61,000. Now, 51, 52,000 of that is the hospital stay and the operating room and all that stuff. And the valve itself actually only costs $6,000. So that's a really small piece of it. Now, let's contrast that with, uh, with this percutaneously placed aortic valve. The hospital costs go down to only about 16 grand. But now the valve, the companies are charging 25 grand, quite a bit more than a $6,000 valve, right? Uh, so gee, you know, what's gonna happen there? Well, but there's still a cost reduction of 28%. So the cost reduction from the hospital infrastructure and the, you know, somebody being in the hospital itself is like $36,000. So what we can do as entrepreneurs, if we can make this work and make this happen, is we can garner 19,000 of that for, for margin on our valve. So we got this great high margin, uh, high price product, right, that we can sell, but everybody's a winner because we're gonna save 17,000 of that for the, for the uh, insurers and the, and the providers. And so, you know, when you have a situation where uh, everybody comes out ahead that does better for the patient, does better for the physician, the insurer and the hospital, uh, then, you know, this is a winner and this is a way that you can have a very successful company and, uh, uh, and still uh, help the system save money, all right? And this company was actually sold last year to Boston Scientific for $450 million uh, at a very early stage. So, you know, very successful for those entrepreneurs. So um, let's talk about um, the, the criteria that a venture person like myself uh, would have in evaluating medical companies. And I'm gonna talk about device companies because that's my background. It'd be a little bit different for drug companies, but it might give you some idea. Um, so um, these are, there are several kind of buckets that I'll put it in, in terms of what that we would look for. Um, in terms of market, is it big? We hopefully be above a total available market of something like a, in excess of a billion dollars, but probably wouldn't touch if it wasn't at least a half a billion dollars, okay? And these are probably lower numbers than it takes even for the IT businesses um, because this is higher margin products. Um, and then um, the product, uh, the product itself, does it have uh, intellectual property covering it so somebody can't copycat it? Uh, is it? Is it hard, is it easy to make or hard to make? What kind of cost of goods uh, can we get for it? Is it easy to train and implement? Does it work well? Um, and then the management team, are there people at this company, founders, uh, management, CEO, who have been there, done that? Because one of our jobs as venture capitalists is to reduce risk in companies. I mean, these startup companies have risk all over them. And we're, we're not looking to add more risk by hiring somebody who's actually never done that before and haha, ha, we'll see if they can do it. What we wanna do is find somebody who has experience to have done something very similar before and put them in that position. So, so that's another thing we would look at. <coughs> Excuse me, and the business model. Uh, what, by that, what I mean is how, do we, how does the company make money? Is it a razor, razor blade type model? Is it capital equipment? Um, what kind of sales cycle does it have? You know, what kind of revenue ramp can you get? Because what's the price point? You know, how do you make money in essence? And, and that's what that means. And then this last point is that um, the financial deal. It, it, for me as an investor, I'm investing uh, money from pension funds and from uh, foundations and their financial investors so that they can pay their pensioners their money. And so I need to make a really good return for this high risk type of investment for my investors. And so if, if the deal, no matter how great all these other things are, if it's not the right price and the right terms, then, then I can't invest. Um, so the other point to take away from this is that it's not any given one of these, it's the amalgam of what does this look like to me as an investment vehicle? Because I'm in the business, I get paid to make money for my investors in high risk uh, specialty type investments, okay? So it's gotta have some elements of all of those that look good to me. 
So let's talk about the technology for a minute. Um, often, uh, young entrepreneurs in their career may say, well, you know, I came up with this concept. Uh, here it is on my cocktail napkin. And um, you know, the rest is just sort of you know, implementation. And, uh, and so at the end of this deal, I ought to really own maybe even ha you know, about half the company or something. Well, you know, not so. The, tech, tech, uh, the re reason for that is the technology itself isn't particularly monetizable in and of itself. What you need to do is you need to take that technology and create a product uh, that is commercial, that is approved, and that, uh, you know, that works, has been tested. Um, and then you need to take that product and you need to create a company around it so it can prosecute the business. You need a manufacturing organization, an R&D organization. You need to, somebody to go out and sell it and market it, right? So you need to add that. And then in the end, what you really have is a business. And, and by business, what I mean is a, a, um, a revenue stream and a profit stream, a customer franchise, an organization to support it. So that, that's what, uh, if you did an IPO, that's what Wall Street is really valuing. It's that business entity and all of those things, not just the technology in and of itself. So how are you going to get from just an idea on a napkin to uh, a, a full-fledged business that's going to be highly valued? Um, well, you're going to need a lot of help. And that's people, meaning your team and your organization, meaning outside expertise like lawyers, accountants, maybe regulatory consultants, reimbursement consultants. <laughs> Um, and you're going to need money. That's where me as a venture capitalist, that's where I come in. You're going to need to convince people to go along with your vision and your idea and to believe in you and therefore give you the money. And they're going to need to make a return for it. So um, you know, everybody needs some help. The, the, um, there is an expression that uh, uh, is actually a Nigerian proverb that uh, Hillary Clinton made famous in her book, um, It Takes a Village to Raise a Child. Well, I'll tell you, it takes a village to raise a startup company. <laughs> and, and this is, a, you, you don't do it by yourself, and, and this is a part of it. Okay? Um, so let's talk about some of the characteristics of successful companies that I've, uh, I've seen, and maybe how to, how to categorize or bucket different types of companies, because different types of companies have different characteristics. So, first of all, within the medical device arena, there are different types of products. Um, for instance, there's capital equipment. I used to be with General Electric Medical Systems, and I sold things like CAT scanners and MRIs. Uh, you can make a lot of money with that. They're big ticket items. But you know, guess what? It took me well over a year to sell a CAT scanner. That's the very tough business model for a venture-backed uh, company, right? And, and the inventory and to build these things, it costs a lot of money. So very tough uh, model for venture-backed companies. But nevertheless, it can be successful. Um, there's things like implantables. Those uh, have been, in the past, quite popular for uh, startup companies because they tend to be high margin products, uh, high value add for disease states that are really bad. Uh, the downside of those is that they're tougher regulatory and tougher reimbursement. And so you know, there's some hurdles to get through, and they take a lot more capital. Um, and then there's disposables, uh, and that could, that's usually not like plastic pieces. It's usually some high-tech uh, instrument that is used in a very specific way for a procedure, and that's also very fertile ground for startup companies. Um, and then, you know, looking at uses, what, what's going to be the use of that product, and what's that going to tell me about uh, what this company is all about? Um, well, there are diagnostics. And those tend to be lower margin, lower price products, but they tend to be really big markets. Uh, like, for instance, diabetes monitoring, you know, the little meters that, that people use um, uh, to measure uh, for glucose. And then um, therapeutics are actually some therapy or treatment that you're going to do to somebody. That tends to be much higher margin products. So any of these models can be successful as a venture-backed startup, but um, the characteristics of them and, and what's going to be important is going to be different for those kinds of things. And then there's another way that you can bucket opportunities or companies. Uh, and that is what I'm calling the new paradigm, or a, a very revolutionary type uh, of a product or investment versus a what we'll call cheaper, better, faster, or evolutionary. Both of these can also be successful and have been in the medical business. Um, 
uh, there are certain characteristics of them. Uh, on the new paradigm, the revolutionary type companies, um, you probably recognize this. This is a, the S curve that is that demarks you know adoption, and it's very much uh, you know alive and well in the in the uh, medical business. Uh, you get your early adopters, people that are pioneers that are doing cutting edge work, and they evangelize what you're doing. And then you get you know what one of my mentors called the unwashed masses, sort of slowly adopting it after they've heard about it, and some of the experts have tried it. And then in the end, you get kind of the last laggards, and, uh, and then it becomes a standard of care de facto at, at some point. And so the secret to success in these evolutionary, or these, excuse me, these revolutionary type companies is can we take this S curve and push it back and to the left? The faster we can do that, the more successful we're going to be. The faster we can push adoption, uh, the more successful we're going to be, particularly as early stage investors and as founders. But sometimes what happens is this takes forever. Uh, if people are slow to adopt, it takes forever. It stretches way, way out here. And even though in the end it might actually be adopted, the people who were the founders or the early stage investors, they probably didn't do very well with it because it was too much time and money to, uh, gone by for them to take advantage. So you need to really think about those concepts. Um, and then here's something to think about as a, as a evolutionary type opportunity or a cheaper, better, faster. Uh, timing to market is always crucial. And so execution is very crucial. The team being experienced is incredibly important. Um, and it's often, but not always, best to be first in a market. I can give you some examples of, of either. Uh, one of them is a company I worked for, for called Nelcor. They're now actually part of Covidian, but they were the ones to, uh, to put um, pulse oximeters on the map. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those as little things that are put on the finger. If you've ever had anesthesia for dental work or whatever, they measure the um, oxygen saturation in your blood. And um, this com company, Nelcor, uh, there had been pulse oximeters available on the market. They didn't invent it. It was used as a research tool. But their, uh, their insight was, how are we going to use this? And, and uh, Bill knew the founder of Nelcor was an anesthesiologist. And he said, I really want to use this as an anesthesia safety monitor. I want to know if my patient is crashing so I can do something about it. Because there's a tremendous problem with anesthesia deaths that are needless. And um, so he positioned, he was the first to position it as that. And I was part of the team when it was a venture backed startup that grabbed a huge market share and developed that market. And they stayed a dominant market share, 70 or 80% for a good number of years because they had that jump on people. Uh, but that's not always uh, the best position to be in. I was also uh, involved in the founding um, in the early days of a company called Embolic Protection Inc. And that's an interventional radiology and cardiology product. Um, there were some companies ahead of this company, EPI, uh, to that market uh, with a different type of design. And they really pioneered the market and made people accept, what am I going to use embolic protection for? It took a lot of time and money, but that company, the first company, was successful. Embolic protection came along as a fast follower or a second generation product, a very different product concept, but after the same uh, uh, end result. And they, they, uh, they, that company was also bought by Boston Scientific early on. But they came out of the market, and they took 70% market share within six months. So that was also a very successful investment for us on less time and money than what the original guys did. So it could go either way. Depends on what's going on in that market. So, um, so just to maybe summarize some difficult business models for healthcare startups uh, would be the large expenditure products, like my example with the CAT scanners. Very hard to do on venture back money. Low price point products. Uh, I use it with a uh, IV catheter company. It was selling catheters for six bucks. Now, they got a great premium for very specific uh, uh, applications, but catheters are normally 50 cents to 85 cents. Uh, and, and it takes an awful lot of them at six bucks each to actually you know, pull your revenue up to 20 or 30 million where you can get cash flow positive. So that's a tough business model for a startup. Uh, a large number of call points. If you had to call on every general practitioner in the United States, it's hundreds of thousands of people. Can a, can a venture back company put a sales force out to get to that? Probably not. But if they were selling to an electrophysiologist group, which is like a specialized type of cardiologist, it's only like three or 4,000 of them in the whole world, you can put on a sales force that's reasonably small and still get to those people. So um, 
than uh, consumer products. Uh, consumer products are uh, ten generally tend to have expensive distribution channels. Like, for instance, if you have to go through Walgreens and CVS, I mean, these guys will really hit you up big for a big part of the profit. It's very tough. And it's very expensive to get to consumers. Uh, consumer advertising, certainly on television or magazines or that kind of thing, are quite expensive. It's easier with the internet, but nevertheless, it's, it's difficult. There's also restrictions on what you can say as a consumer product, uh, and you have to be careful about that. The other thing I wanted to bring up, and particularly for a group uh, that may be pretty IT-oriented, is um, that if a physician is required attention on something, then they're going to need to, need to be paid for it. I mean, we had these guys come into our office saying, oh, you know, we have this iPhone, and we have this little attachment, and we can put it in our chest, and we can see our ECGs. And it's like, uh-huh, OK, what are you going to do with that? Well, we can send it to the doctor and see what the doctor says if there's a problem. Well, you know, the doctor, number one, is going to need to be paid. He's not going to just sort of every once in a while when you feel like it, look at your EKG. You know, it's got to be a system and infrastructure. They get paid for doing that, for one thing. And for another thing, you just can't wing these things over the internet. There's HIPAA rules. There's rules about privacy. So you know, there's a lot more complicated um, than what people might think in terms of the, those types of uh, investments. So what are the characteristics of some successful investments I've seen? Well. Almost always, it's passionate, talented founders and a management team. Um, and that is particularly people that are good self-aware self and good self-assessors at what am I really good at and what can I do and what should I, should I bring in the right help and the right experience for. Um, and, uh, but, but mainly, you know, can they really get some things done and get it executed? Uh, and then another thing is a compelling market opportunity and a superior solution. It's like I said before, if all stakeholders are winners, physicians, uh, uh, patients, the, the uh, hospitals or, or whatever providers and the insurance companies, then you got a winner there. Um, and it's got to be a big opportunity. And then uh, you know, business models that fin fit with venture funding. You know, like I said, it's very hard for uh, capital equipment type deals but it may work out very well for uh, razor, razor blade type deals. Then uh, what are some, success, some characteristics of unsuccessful companies? Well, quite often it's the team failure. And that might not be because they were bad people. It just might mean that they had poor leadership skills or maybe not very good management skills or lack of teamwork. Uh, maybe they're not just not the right skills at the right place at the right time. Maybe they use too much money too fast, not cash efficient enough. And, and in the end, it's, uh, it's really a failure to execute. Um, and then there's technical clinical failures. These are a little bit more forgivable because there's a certain element of risk in our business. And that is that you, know, you just could get the product to, you know, there's some invention involved here, and you could never get the product to work like it's supposed to. Or maybe it's that, the, that uh, you did a clinical trial, and you ran into some unknown you know, reason why this really doesn't work clinically on many people or, or enough people. Um, and then you know, quite often, a clinical failure is, is, is a lack of knowledge about which, pa which patient groups are going to benefit the most. Um, some other unsuccessful investment uh, problems with unsuccessful investments, um, regulatory and reimbursement. These are by far and away the most difficult thing in my medical device market today. The, the uh, FDA and really the worldwide regulators are kind of on a conservative uh, cycle right now. And um, so it has been become much more challenging and difficult, a lot more time and money involved in getting it moved through the regulatory process and then getting insurers to pay for anything new. Um, so it might be a failure to be able to do that on time and money allowed. Um, and then also um, business model. If the business model just wasn't right to be done on venture funding, maybe it was too much money up front. Uh, to uh, allow success in the venture business, or maybe it's just the, you know, the economic environment and a failure to be able to raise money. Uh, money's scarce right now. So that's uh, something that's going on with our markets right now. So um, that sort of covers what I was going to talk about in terms of the medical industry itself. And so what I thought I would do is tell you a little bit about um, some career path considerations that have occurred to me you know, in my journey through, um, through, through my career. Um, and so I have put it together a little biograph of my uh, career. 
Uh, I started out uh, as an engineer also, undergrad, like, like, uh, like uh, many of you. Uh, I was a, a biomedical engineer out of Purdue University. And I went into Purdue thinking that, you know, I'd, I'd watch this show that was on at the time called The Six Million Dollar Man, and, you know, he had bi bionic eyes and all sorts of cool stuff. And, you know, I thought I was going to design The Six Million Dollar Man. That, that was my career goal. And, and, and through the process of my undergrad education, I got a lot of exposure to you know, design as well as analytics and a lot of things, and also some great summer jobs that exposed me to a lot of industries and a lot of roles. And, and what I figured out is that you know I was not going to make my fame and fortune as a design engineer. <laughs> that just was not my talent, you know. But. I, what I figured out is, well, you know, I'm pretty good at understanding technical situations and then explaining them to somebody else and breaking them down. And, and I had some exposure to people who were doing technical sales and technical marketing and decided that that was a very good fit for me. Um, and, and again, it goes back to this, it takes a village. You don't have to be the inventor. You can be, but you don't have to be the inventor to uh, be successful as an entrepreneur or to be successful in a career, uh, and certainly in healthcare or in many other businesses. Um, so I went to, uh, uh, I started with a large company. I, I started out uh, with the General Electric Company. Didn't really get much larger than that at the time. They were the largest company in the world, I think, maybe besides General Motors. Um, uh, and had a, had a great experience learning how to sell a technical product. Um, and then I went uh, on a leave of absence and got my MBA at, at Harvard Business School and came out to California, and that's really when I started my entrepreneurial adventure. I went with this company, Nelcor, that was a venture back company uh, that was just building a, a, a marketing positioning uh, and teaching the world about pulse oximeters. Uh, I was in product marketing for a good number of years, uh, both at that company, then I went with another even earlier stage uh, startup company called Menlo Care. They hadn't even started their marketing and sales yet. Um, and that company is now a part of uh, Johnson Johnson. And then general marketing management with a company called Ventratex that was uh, an implantable defibrillator uh, company and uh, a little bit different type of business model uh, and uh, was, uh, was managing their launch to the market. And then uh, I actually went back to a large company, but it was Medtronic is a very large company, but it had bought a startup company and brought me in as a VP of sales and marketing. So that was an experience of a small company, but within a, a large company. And, and, that, and that taught me a lot of things as well. And then about 15 years ago, I went on to do venture capital investing. And you know now I'm really um, investing in the same types of companies that I helped build before. Um, and so just a few comments on that for you as, as relatively young in your careers and thinking about a lot of different possibilities for careers. Um, I had a band director that said, you know, you don't know what you like, you like what you know. <laughs> And you know that makes a lot of sense because you know it's it's uh, you know the marketing term unaided awareness. You just have a hard time of thinking of something that you like if you've never even seen it before, right? So I, I would encourage you to think broadly about a wide variety of industries um, with your technology backgrounds, careers, and roles within those industries. Um, and also to look for companies where you feel that you can be educated and mentored. And always to do a continuous self-assessment. You know, what am I really good at? Honestly, what am I good at? What am I uh, really passionate about? You know, and and how, how can I fit that with, with uh, my next step in my career? And, um, and, and I urge you to think big, but be very pragmatic about, OK, I want to get from here to there. Now, what are the steps that I'm going to need to do to get there? And, and then contrasting, should I go with a large company or a small company? I get asked that a lot by people, uh, you know, MBAs and people young in their career. And there's some, some advantages to both. Um, uh, the, a large company, you're going to get exposed to a lot of different kinds of practices before you get in the situation at a startup company where you've got to pick the best practice. It's hard to pick the best practice if you've never even seen very many. You know, and um, uh, managers are incented at big companies to mentor young people uh, and to spend time with you and bring you along. Uh, the best managers by far and away I had were at General Electric and at Medtronic, whereas the startup companies might have been excellent people, but they didn't have a heck of a lot of time to mentor me because they had to just be in there and do it. All right. Um, and uh, but uh, going with a startup company, on the other hand, you get more self-directed activities. Uh, initiative and creativity is definitely rewarded. Uh, 
it is trial by fire. And so if you don't have some background uh, and some good experience to back you up when you go into that situation, it's a much higher risk of failure. Uh, and there's high uh, employment volatility and high volatility in terms of your financial rewards with a startup company. And there's really not much of any time for mentoring. They put you in that job, they expect you to just do it and get it done. And, and they're not a lot of time to have you know, ways to bring you along. And, and thinking about um, functional roles, again, it takes a village to raise a child or a startup company. And, and it takes people with expertise in a lot of different areas to bring it along and make it a real business that's highly valuable. So um, but it, it, entrepreneurs, the entrepreneur could be any, in any of these roles or have experience and background in any of these roles. Um, the important thing is that there is a common vision of what is unique about this company. And that could be not an invention, but maybe a new business model innovation. Uh, and that's more like the IT business in that way. Or it's, it's a clinical application for a technology that already exists in some other realm. Or it could be, in fact, a, a new invention, a real secret sauce. But any of those things could do it. And, and any of these people could be an entrepreneur or be with an entrepreneurial company and play a key role. Um, so you can think about um, what, what might be a fit for you. Um, and then the other comment I wanted to make is um, there are entrepreneurial opportunities in all sorts of disparate economic conditions. Um, as everyone's quite aware, you know, there's a lot of economic disruption going on right now. It's a very tough economy, right? Very tough on a global economy. Well, chaos creates opportunities. And some of the most successful venture back companies, or not just venture back startup companies, period, um, have been started in times of pretty bad uh, you know, economy. Uh, and, and the reason is because um, there is there's, there's cost savings themes, there are things are changing, so there's room for somebody doing something new. Uh, the nimble companies are the ones that are going to survive and thrive, and, and companies that manage their cash, because in bad economic times, there's just not a lot of capital to go around. Now, there's times of economic growth, like for instance in the 90s. It was a tremendous time of economic growth here in the United States. Um, strong growth is very forgiving of mistakes. You can make some mistakes and still do really well. Um, and the market is receptive, uh, receptive to new uh, adoption of new things and new opportunities there as well. And it's much easier to get capital. It's pretty plentiful. But then there's also competition, because everybody else is out trying to get capital as well. Um, so, you can be, I would say to you as early in your career, you can be successful as an entrepreneur in any kind of an economy. You just got to recognize what it is and what's going on so that you, um, that you, you manage your business uh, to, to fit the situation. And then um, in talking about industry subsectors for entrepreneurs, uh, these four bubbles, the healthcare, IT, clean tech, and consumer retail are probably what most of the venture business, at least, has funded to date. Uh, those are kind of the, the categories. Um, so we don't know what this next new entrepreneurial industry is going to be. And you know, maybe somebody in this room, this is an incredibly talented group with, with highly educated people and a lot of initiative. Maybe one of you guys are going to be the, the, the leaders of, of what, what's next in terms of the real entrepreneurial wave. Um, so uh, you can be successful in all of those things. And, and one comment and observation I have is that these areas of overlap um, in these disciplines are really ripe for innovation. They're very fertile grounds. Particularly, I mean, I understand from ICLAC that there's some folks here, for instance, who are, uh, are doing the uh, joint Master of the tr tr Master of Transitional Medicine. Translational, translational medicine. OK, so if you've got deep experience and knowledge in, let's say, medicine that, and you know, the medical area and technology and business, wow, you may be at the, at the area where maybe there are people out there that know one thing or another, but they don't know all of those things. So you have an incredibly unique opportunity to identify these areas that might be ripe for innovation. So I'd encourage you to, to look at that and to think about that. So. 
this is my uh, top five reasons uh, to go into healthcare. Hopefully, we'll be able to recruit some of you folks to go into healthcare uh, as a technology entrepreneur. Uh, number one, the opportunities for creativity to solve problems are are are, are desperately needed. You, you saw the problems there with my Keith Keith Richards guy and my Fat David. Uh, <laughs> And, um, and so especially at the intersection of medicine and, 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 and business and, uh, and technology. Uh, then uh, it's a large market and it's growing fast, one of the biggest ones out there, if not the biggest, uh, in the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and, and high values companies can be created. It's got a history of being successful. Um, they're high margin, highly differentiated products uh, that create value. And, you can actually directly benefit your family and your friends uh, by the profession that you've chosen if, if you can do well in this market. Now, wow, how many, you know, how many industries can say that? That you know, maybe your friend's father has uh, got congestive heart failure and you've invented or helped bring forward some commercial opportunity you know, that helps him. Wow, that's cool. So the number one thing is that saving lives is priceless. And, and and if you think about your career as a whole, yes, you want to be successful, you want to make money for your family, you want to have something that's, uh, that's rewarding intellectually, but you also, you know, there's something to really be said for the intrinsic value to know that you made a difference. And, and to me, this is one of the things I really valued about uh, my career in healthcare. Wow, what could be better than that? So um, something to really think about. Um, this is a quote from Churchill. He was actually talking about the RAF. <laughs> Never has so, uh, has so much been owed by so many to so few, but I guess I could also say that about the uh, medical uh, entrepreneurs out there that, that, that you have a shot at, you know, at, at picking up the mantle for. And um, it, it's a tremendously rewarding experience. So I hope maybe I've, I've uh, put a spark in there for some of you to be able to do that. So just to, uh, to, to wrap up, um, so Onset Ventures is both a medical and an IT uh, venture firm. Uh, and this is just a smattering of some of the uh, successful medical companies that we've uh, backed over our 27-year history. Uh, what we're investing is, is things that change uh, the way business is done or the way medicine is practiced. Something that's very compelling, uh, business to business generally opportunity quite often. We're not so much um, consumer oriented. Um, we uh, have over, over a billion under management and our current fund is $205 million. Uh, again, diversified fund. So what, what I hope that I've inspired you for is that you'll end up coming and talking to us someday about your ont uh, entrepreneurial opportunity, whether it be medical or IT. And uh, we'd love to talk to you about that. We, we, we can change the world uh, no matter what the economy. So I would encourage you to do that. And with that, I'll open it up to questions. Yeah.